And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live with you today, and I'm going to try to stir you up with something. Um, somebody called today, and I couldn't take the phone call, and they sent an email. And um, he is requesting that I uh, not put his name out there, but um, I am waiting on a phone number from him. And if you are listening, you recognize that this is you. I want you to send me a phone number. I need the phone number to the sheriff's office. Uh, he's got an interesting story here. And um, if it's if it's like he said in the email, uh, I think something something should be done. Um, here is the here is what he sent me. I'm going to call him. Uh, let's see. I better write this down, or I'll mess it up. I'm going to call him Charlie. All right. You're Charlie. How you doing, Charlie? Uh, Charlie says I've been listening to you for a year or so, and I threw my NIV in the trash. I now only have a KJV in my home. I got disgusted with all the false teachers on YouTube and was about to give up. And then I found you. He's talking about Pastor Mike here. He said, I've been under attack since listening to your teachings. Um, you've been under attack because you threw your NIV away and you started reading and believing what the King James Bible said. That's why you were under attack. Um, it really doesn't, I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with me. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Um, but I could go off the scene tomorrow and your Bible would still be there and the devil would hate you just as much, if not more. Uh, but anyway, here's what happened. He said, I have a son that's incarcerated at the Blount, B-L-O-U-N-T, Blount Blunt County Justice Center in Blount County, Tennessee. Uh, this is Maryville. He says it's a beautiful place, the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. I've been in that area, but it is beautiful. But tourists complain of a police harassment issue, three police departments in this small area. Apparently, he, Charlie's son, was listening to me and you before he found himself to be an inmate uh, because he requested a King James Bible from the prison ministry. In other words, when he, when he ended up in prison, don't, I don't know what the charges are. It doesn't matter. Um, when he got there, he wanted not just any Bible, wanted a King James Bible from the prison ministry. And Charlie says, I play your sermons loudly. Computer hooked up to speakers. He always complained. So he had the King James Bible with all his personal study notes in it for seven months in his cell until a week ago. The jail conducted a night raid looking for contraband. They do this from time to time. Um, I like to watch cops. There's another program called Jail. I don't know if you've seen this program. It's not, I'm telling you, it's not for everybody. But they, they, they go to the intake places of certain county jails, Los Angeles, uh, different places, Las, Las Vegas, I mean, different places like that. Um, and the people that come in that are being brought in by policemen, a lot of them are drunk. That's what they pretty much feature on there because those are the people who are going to be the most active. I'm not kidding you. You can see devils in their, in their countenance. You can see it. I can't describe to you. I don't see horns and fire shooting out of noses. I don't see anything like that. But you can look at these people, and there are devils there. Some would say, well, that's just the effect of the alcohol plus the methamphetamines plus the cocaine plus the marijuana that they were using all at once plus the uh, Oxycontin that they were snorting at the time. That's just the that's what you see that it does things in their mind. Yeah, I agree with that. But I also know 
that the Bible's telling us to be sober in our minds for a reason. If we're not sober, we will not recognize the lion when he roars against us. Um, sobriety is this big firewall. You know what a firewall is? It's like the back of your fireplace or it's like the wall that separates the inside of your car from where the engine is. Um, I used to hang drywall, work in construction. When we, when a garage was attached to the house, we had to use a different type of drywall inside that garage. It was a, it was a thicker drywall. It was five eighths inches instead of half inch, and it was uh, it was full of um, fiberglass in it, and it was a flame retardant type drywall. And I'll tell you, a twelve foot sheet of that standing on a bench or some sort of scaffold and you're holding two guys are holding this 12 foot long sheet of drywall up with one hand while they're reaching in their pouch for a nail they're going to nail it off to the ceiling and then change hands again so you can get your hammer and drive the nail in and you do that for a couple hours you've done some work i didn't weigh 300 pounds when i hung drywall i'll tell you that but the, that firewall is to protect, it's a barrier between what's on fire and you. You've got one in your mind. It's called sobriety. It's called consciousness. We have the ability to let in what we want in and to keep out what we want out. When you are drunk or you are high or you are under the influence of all these mind-altering drugs, you don't have that ability. You don't have that ability anymore. And um, I just, anyway, I kind of got off on that. But I, I get the whole raid thing because you'd be surprised at what they find in jails and in prisons when, when, they, when they go through and they start doing a search of these, um, of these cells. But here's the point. The jail conducted a night raid looking for contraband. They do this three times a year. The inmates were terrified. 30 or more SWAT-type guards with a couple of German shepherds pulled each inmate out of a cell, face down, handcuffed them, and shouted obscenities while they searched the cells. My son requested that they not take his Bible. They threatened to tase him if he turned his head again to look at them. Well, they took it, along with other Christian material. The local radio station... Um, the local radio station aired the story a couple of times last week. Even two commissioners of faith tried and were told the Bible was returned. It was not. What was returned was a book called Young Life. I never even heard of that one. Um, over the weekend, my son was told by the night shift supervisor, a female, that the KJV was not an approved version for the inmates in this facility. Um, do they refuse a Muslim the Koran or the Catholic a Catholic Bible? I feel like I'm facing Goliath and that our local government is corrupt. Would the listeners stand with me? I'm very discouraged. Send letters, make calls to sheriff. I'm going to give you the sheriff's name. And Charlie, um, if you would send me a phone number, I will put it up on the screen. Um... Sheriff Barong, B-E-R-R-O-N-G. This is Blount County, B-L-O-U-N-T, Tennessee. Uh, give them a call, and I will say this. Don't call them. Uh, don't, I shouldn't have to say this. Don't cuss them out. Don't be belligerent with them. You be respectful. This man, this sheriff, has a place of authority that God put him in that place of authority. You may not agree with that. Doesn't matter. That's what your Bible tells you. If you're going to call, use, be polite, but request that this young man get his Bible back. Um, Charlie, I'm not sure how they, the listeners should address this because you, um, you asked me not to use names. So anyway, if you don't do anything but pray that this young man will get his King James Bible back, not somebody else's NIV, but a King James Bible, 
Maybe that's something that you can spend some time praying about this week. I've got uh, a couple of news items today, and we're going to deal with something in Matthew 24. Um, a man sent me today, um, and I, I loved it. It was a really neat collation of the Olivet Discourse. If you don't know what that is, that's Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. That's Jesus teaching about what's going to happen in the end times. Um, and this guy co collated all of the scriptures together. In other words, if Matthew talked about wars and rumors of wars, then he included the verse in, in Mark and Luke that, that said nearly the same thing. Um, and it, it was pretty neat. I like, I like how he did it. And I read over that today. And it's just, it's just interesting to just read the scriptures without somebody's notes, without somebody's comments, without Finnis Dake's irrationality splattered all over it, um, without the spirit-filled life application junk at the bottom, just nothing but the scriptures. It's very, it's rewarding, number one. It's very refreshing, number two. And you just feel like you're listening to God himself, which, of course, you are. Uh, but we're going to look at something that I, th I just had a thought here probably a year ago. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to look into that. And I'm just going to float a little idea out to you today, give you something to think about. And you go back to the Bible and say, is God is hoggard stupid or what? That's all you got to do. Okay. And God will probably tell you, oh, duh. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's see here. Uh, who sent me this? Who sent me this? Kathy and Eric sent me this. The United Nations declared June 21st. You know what that is? That's the summer solstice. You know what that, let me, y'all know what that is. There are four seasons. There are four times in the year that, uh, that sort of mark the patterns of the sun in relation to the earth. The spring equinox is when they, they are equal. There's 12 hours in a day. Think of, uh, think of John chapter 11. Jesus said, what? No, you know that there are 12 hours in a day. Well, that's true. Two days of the year, March 21st, that's the spring equinox. The, the times are equal. The autumnal or fall equinox in uh, September 21st, those two days are the days when there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. The winter solstice, shortest day of the year, it's because the, the position of the earth in relation to the sun, it's leaning far, far, far away. It's up in Missouri. It's difficult to drive in the morning and in late in the afternoon because the sun is so low on the horizon and it stays that way all day long. Maybe even worse for those living farther north than us. But the sun is so, it just stays so low on the horizon. It's just every time you get in and drive in the morning and in, late in the afternoon, you got the sun staring you right in the face. But the summer solstice is when the sun becomes the most high. Are you catching that? Every day, you and I see the sun rise in the east and set in the south. And at noon, it is at its most high place every day. And every year, the sun does the same thing, only north and south. In the winter solstice, the sun is to the south. It's right over the Tropic of, let's see here, Tropic of, I can't remember if it's Cancer or Capricorn, south of the equator. And then on the, um, the equinox, it is right directly over the equator at the equinox. And then in the summer solstice, it, is, it has risen to the north. It goes from south to north. The summer solstice is when it's at its most high place. Think about it. So here's what the UN wants you to do. They want you to celebrate yoga. Um, three months after India's newly elected Prime Minister Narendra Modi 
used some of his valuable minutes during his address to the United Nations General Assembly to introduce it. With an unprecedented 177 countries signed on, including the United States, China, France, United Kingdom, and Russia, it might be an indication that the winds are changing. The resolution adopted by the General Assembly garnered a record number of co-sponsors. In my recent, I don't see, read how much of this is in here. The article says there are many forms of yoga today, and in America alone, there are 155 yogic practices and over 60 million practitioners. India has historically been known for its mysticism, yoga, and meditation. During the recent launch of the Huffington Post in India at Taj Palace Hotel in New Delhi, Ariana Huffington, the chair, president, editor in chief of the Huffington Post, said to a group of leaders that India is in the unique position to offer the Eastern traditions of meditation and yogic methods to de stress folks in the West. The question here in India is. Are Indians ready to return to its mystical ways of being as a people and a country rather than chasing after the Maya of the West through practicing Raja Yoga, which directs the intellect to connect to the divine? See, that's what the word yoga is. The word yoga means connect. Think about all these churches that are doing connect groups. We're going to connect. We're all going to connect together. We're going to connect with God if you come to this group. By the way, the connect group meets in the same room as the yoga, the Christian yoga group. And as soon as they're done meditating, then you can go into the same room and do the connect group. This Churches are doing yoga now. And um, this is an illustration that I have coming up in... Uh, the Watchman video broadcast, the the person who does yoga, who sits in the uh, lotus position, they got their knees splayed out there, and their hands, are, their arms, their hands are on top of their knees, and they're making signs with their fingers or flicking boogers off or whatever it is they're doing. They're sitting there, and I want you to imagine now their third eye, where the mark of the beast is going to go on the forehead, their third eye, which if you look at the back of the dollar bill, here's the all-seeing eye. And then it's the capstone on top of the pyramid. When a person does yoga, when they are sitting in the lotus position with their hands on their knees, they become the pyramid. Are you catching that? They are acting out the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the New World Order. They're acting out the religion of the Antichrist. The ascendancy of the Antichrist. That's what they're doing in yoga. And churches are doing it. Now the United Nations says, let's all, let's just all sit down and yoga together. That'll make the world a whole lot better. Coming to, coming to a church near you, I guarantee you. Here's something related to that. Amid the chattering of the global elite, a silent interlude. This is from Davos, Switzerland, for 10 minutes at the World Economic Forum here on Woden's Day afternoon, a conference room jammed with more than 100 high-powered delegates was entirely silent. Wouldn't you hate to be sitting in that room and all of a sudden you belched or broke wind? Wouldn't you hate that? It's like everybody's all quiet and you're just going, I can't hold it in any longer. Um, let's see here. The rare interlude of equanimity came during a panel leading uh, a panel called "Leading Mindfully," a discussion of how meditation was impacting the workplace. Maybe you're maybe you work a job somewhere, and your company has paid for you the employees to go to a seminar about how to meditate, how to do yoga to relieve stress, how to do guided imagery, how to do those things. A lady sent me um, some information. I've got it in my notes. I probably should have pulled it up today. Uh, she sent me some information about how her youth pastor, the youth pastor at her church, 
her daughter was telling her this. Mom, the youth pastor, got something wrong with him. He's telling us to all sitting in the room, sitting on her, uh, sitting on the floor with her legs crossed, and he's telling us to close our eyes, and we close our eyes, and he's just guiding us into this imagery. The youth pastor slash guru is telling these young people to imagine Jesus. Why should I? Why don't I just read his word? If I want to get an accurate description of Jesus of Nazareth, why don't I just read the Bible? But they want these people to, to imagine him. And when they've got this, imagine him on the cross. And while they're imagining him on the cross, the, the meditation leader, the youth pastor, I'll tell you, I don't care what church you're in. I don't care what, I don't say, we're strict conservative. We don't put up with that. I don't care how strict conservative or whatever your church is. Be careful with youth pastors. Be careful. That's all I'm saying. Are there good ones out there? Sure there are. Be careful. The youth pastor is guiding them to imagine in this little deep trance that he's putting them into Jesus on the cross. And then he gets them here. Here we go. Here, we, here we, he says, Jesus is opening his mouth now and he's going to say something to you. What do you imagine Jesus saying to you? Write that down. That now becomes the new word of God for these people. Because after all, Jesus said it and he said it to me. So that's my new word of God. That's my new Bible. And anytime I want to hear from God, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to imagine Jesus or God, or I'm going to imagine this, imagine that, and imagine what they will say to me. And that's, that's my word of God right there. Violates Revelation 22, but they don't care. They don't care anything about the Bible to begin with. But here's these global elite doing contemplative prayer, looks like. A mix of breathing instructions management theory and personal reflection. The session provided a stark counterpoint to the frenzied discussions about geopolitical instability, currency fluctuations, and climate change in nearby rooms. Um, this is very unusual event at the World Economic Forum and it's diagnostic of something much larger that is happening, said John Kabat-Zinn, a molecular biologist who helped popularize mindfulness meditation in recent decades. What was once considered a radical lunatic French thing has been incorporated into medicine, science, academics, and more, he said. And, and I want you to think about this. Here's a molecular biologist amongst the global elite. Molecular biologists are guys who are part of the the overall great work of trying to figure out how to make humans live forever. Where is he getting his scientific ideas? Where is he getting his, his intuition? Where is he getting his thought experiments from? He's getting them from going into the meditation practice, becoming totally silent, um, becoming, as the Bible said, void of understanding making his brain a void and empty space, making space now for God. That's what some of these people are trying to tell you at the church you're, you went to. We need to. We need to empty our minds and create space for God to come into us and God to speak to us. Well, I got that down, don't I? Um, in recent years, meditation has grown more prominent in the business world. Companies including General Mills, Aetna, glad I met you, BlackRock are teaching meditation to their employees, and students at Havid Business School can take classes on mindful leadership. Guess what? Guess what? Bible colleges are next. Bible colleges, seminaries, and workshops 
are, go are probably already being held right now to train youth pastors, um, co-pastors, vice pastors, pastors in charge of vice or whatever it is, training these people to take this back to the churches, to get the people in the church to meditate, to make their mind avoid, to make room for God to come in. And if, and if you're having trouble understanding it, here's a Beth Moore video we can have you watch for us. Even Goldman Sachs is doing it, said William George, a member of the Goldman Sachs board who was on the panel and says, hundreds of the investment banks employees regularly meditate. Stop right here. Is this not proof? 100% proof. Ephesians chapter 2. Do we need true? I just realized the recording wasn't turned on. For the pastor mic online, I lost 30 minutes of this. That's all right. Because I'll probably say the same stuff again probably through three weeks from now. Anyway, not everybody has to be in the Illuminati. Not everybody in politics, business, banking, Hollyweird, uh, Motown, not everybody has to have this secret handshake and a secret tattoo under their armpit that says they're, they're elite, they're, they've devoted their allegiance to the Illuminati and to Satan worship and, and all of this stuff. All you have to do is be not saved. That's all you have to do. Ephesians chapter 2, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Remember those days? Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. This world is on course, of course, for something. Where is it headed to? I will be like the Most High. Then it says... According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You don't have to be a Mason. You don't have to be in the Illuminati. You don't have to join a secret clandestine group of only high ranking people. All that. You, don't have, you don't have to go to the Bilderberg meeting. You don't have to um, participate in stuff like what was in Eyes Wide Shut. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is be lost. This guy on the Goldman Sachs board, hundreds of investment bank employees regularly meditate. What do you think is happening right now? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience is busy pulling everybody together for this one goal, this common thing. Let's unite the currency. Let's unite the nations. Let's unite all the religions. And anybody, you listen to me, anybody, whether they be atheist, agnostic, scientist, lawyer, doctor, banker, grocery store bagger, or preacher or pastor, anybody who does this meditation, contemplative prayer, making a void of their mind, now they're void of understanding, go look that up in the Bible, making a void of their mind, listening to that inner voice on the inside, tell them what to do. They are walking according to to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. They're on his side. If I'll just say this, if you attend church service and you hear the pastor or the vice pastor or the pastor's wife pastor or whoever it is, talk about whispering prayers and the Jesus prayer and Beth Moore and we're all going to have a, like a prayer concert next Friday night we're all going to get together and light candles and it's going to be really dark and we're going to we're going to open ourselves up to God you get out of that church get out of there that 
those people are, are listening to devils. They are. That's what's going on, people. Um, it's a interesting and a, I think, and a dangerous world that we are moving into. And who doesn't see it coming? Who doesn't see these things coming to pass? I mean, Jesus told us. I mean, you, you know, you know, red sky at night, sailor's delight, that sort of thing. You know that's going to happen, right? When you see the tree bud, you know that summer is nigh, right? I mean, you get it, right? You don't even have to clock. You don't have to have a clock. You don't have to have a calendar. You don't need nothing. Just look around you. The signs are everywhere. You can see it coming. You, you can be more accurate in knowing what is going to happen in the future than a New York City weatherman. Boy, they got that one wrong, didn't they? We're going to get 30 inches of snow. It's going to be a blizzard of epic proportions. You'll be telling your grandchildren about the great blizzard of 2015. And they got six inches of snow. 3,000 flights were canceled this week alone because of the blizzard that never happened. Didn't happen. It wasn't there. The weather forecasters are going, well, it's about time we change our software on these computer models because, boy, I tell you what, egg on their face. Um, anyway, do I want to read? The, what is this? Oh, yeah, you're going to like this one. Super rich. Uh, open your Bible to Revelation Revelation 6. Open your Bible up. Come on, I want to hear those pages rattling. Come on. Revelation 6. Super rich hedge fund managers are buying quote unquote secret bolt holes. If you don't look at that and read it right, you'd be in big trouble. Secret Bolt, B-O-L-T, holes, where they can hide out in the event of a civil uprising against growing inequality, it has been claimed. Nervous financiers from across the globe have begun purchasing landing strips, homes, and land in, in areas such as New Zealand so they can flee should people rise up. With growing inequality and riots such as those in London 2011 and in Ferguson and other parts of the USA last year, many financial leaders fear they could become targets for public fury. Robert Johnson, president of the Institute of New Economic Thinking, told people at the World Economic Forum in Davos after they meditated, of course, that many hedge fund managers were already planning their escapes. He said... I know hedge fund managers all over the world who are buying airstrips and farms in places like New Zealand because they think they need a getaway, a bolt hole, you know, from when they bolt out like a lightning bolt. Mr. Johnson said the economic situation could soon become intolerable as even in the richest countries, inequality was increasing. He said... People need to know there are possibilities for their children, that they will have the same opportunity as anyone else. There's a wicked feedback loop. Politicians who get more money tend to use it to get even more money. His comments were backed up by Stuart Wallace, executive director of the New Economics Foundation, who, when asked about the comments, told CNBC Africa, quote, um, getaway cars, the airstrips in New Zealand, and all that sort of thing. So basically, a way to get off. If they can get off onto another planet, some of them would, unquote. He added, um, I think the rich are worried, and they should be worried. I mean, inequality, inequality. Why does it matter? Most people have heard the Oxfam statistics that now we've got 80, the 80 richest people in the world, having more wealth then the bottom 3.5 billion and very soon we'll get a situation where that one percent one percent of the richest people have more wealth than everybody else the 99 percent he said unquote 
Revelation chapter 6. Oh, what are we going to find in our King James Bible? In verse 12, when I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as, you know what that is? That's the, um, what is that? The MOVE conference, Youth with the Mission stuff where they advertise that you come to this conference because we're going to have heaven collide with earth. Do you realize what that is? That's the dragon taking a third of the angels and slapping them down with his tail so they fall to the earth. That's what you see here. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth even as the fig tree, hmm, casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were removed out of their places. And listen to this. Listen to this. Here we go. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountain and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That story tells you this Bible and what it says is exactly dead on. God saw it. What do we see in Revelation 6? We see the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men, the people who have the means. I mean, name a preacher who could buy his own airstrip, Kenneth Copeland. You can't, but other people can, Kenneth Copeland. Yeah, yeah, he's got, Kenneth Copeland has got his own airport it's on his property somewhere in Texas, this huge mansion that he lives in. And in his backyard, he had built his own airport where his own private jet is parked. He's, he can do it. Why can't it? Why, what's your problem? If you, if you had, bless God, if you had enough faith, you could do that. You could move mountains, bless God. If you had enough faith, you could have your own airplane and airstrip and move to New Zealand when it gets real bad. Bless God, if you had enough faith. I am so sick of these people. I am so sick and tired of these word faith people bashing you over the head, telling you every day, that the reason why you're still sick, the reason why you don't have money, the reason why bad things are happening in your life, it's your fault. It's always going to be your fault. It's not God's fault. God wants to give you all this millions of dollars every day. God wants to heal your body, bless God. But he can't because you won't let him. I'm sick of that. I, I hate it. It makes me angry. It puts a heavy burden upon God's people who want to believe God's word. These people lay burdens upon them and tell them, well, if you were just like me, then you would be rich and successful and have all this stuff if you were like me. By the way, you can't be like me. You need to send me $1,000. Now you're $1,000 less, and I'm $1,000 more. They lay heavy burdens on people and tell them it's their own fault for not pleasing God enough to get what they wanted. I told you, I told you, Joyce Meyer's introduction man, I was friends with him. I haven't seen him in years. It's not like we had a falling out. The guy, he was, he was the guy on, when you listen to the radio and now here's Joyce. That was him. I sat down with lunch with him one day, Chinese restaurant. And he said, Mike, he said, I'm, I'm getting out. I said, what? He said, I'm getting out of the charismatic movement. I said, really? He said, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And he was, he was taking a paycheck from Joyce Myers at the time. He said, I, I can't do it no more. He said, it's a joke. A friend of his, let's see, him and Joyce Myers, 
They all went to the same church in Fenton, Missouri, Life Christian Center. And he said, there was a man in our church. He said he was one of the top men in our church. He said he had big business, had lots of money. He donated large sums of money to the church all the time. We'd have Rodney Howard Brown in. We'd have these people come in. He'd give them sacks of money, do everything that he was told to do in the church. And one year he got sick. He started making positive confessions over the sickness, and it didn't go away. Because his sickness was hurting his body so bad, his business suffered. Then it failed. Then he lost his house. And because he lost his house and his money and his business and his health, his wife took his kids and left. So he goes to the pastor. Who was it? What was his name? I can see his face, a little shyster. Goes to his pastor and says, Pastor, I don't understand. I did everything you told me to do, everything Copeland told me to do, everything Joyce told me to do. I did everything. And now I've lost my house. I've lost my business. I've lost all my money. I've lost my wife who took all my money. I've lost my kids. I have nothing. What happened? Pastor, Pastor Rick Shelton. Well, obviously, you're not doing something right before God. God. God is not pleased with you for something in your life, and he's letting you know that he can't do anything until you release him. It's obviously your fault. And that friend of mine who took a paycheck from Joyce Meyer said, I'm out. It's a joke. I sat there calm, and yeah, I'm listening to you. In my heart, I was shouting and laughing. Because he found out the truth. I've lost people. I've lost people that I love dearly. To word, faith, charismatic, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers, Finnis Dake, witchcraft. And I'm very bitter over it. it makes me mad. Uh, what's next here? Anything else? Let's do this. Let's get out our King James Bibles. Everybody got a King James Bible? Well, you're going to need one. We're going to look at something in Matthew 24 that I think is interesting. I think it's very interesting. Um, and it's something that we think the Bible says, but it doesn't actually say that. You ever, you ever run into those things? You start giving somebody scripture, and all of a sudden they're going, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't say that. And you're going, well, yeah, it does, too. And yeah, I'm opening her up right there. And they said, well, it is opening. And what you said, is, it doesn't say that here. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about the King James Bible. And you said, yeah, that's what I've got. i got a King James Bible, and it didn't say that here. You ever had that happen? I've had that happen. It's just a wee bit embarrassing. Take your Bible Matthew chapter 24, in um, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 10. Let me uh, shuffle some papers while you do that. I want to look at some emails real, very quickly. Um, let's see here. Okay, that one. Okay, here we go. Uh, Bobby, appreciate you sending this. The Blount County Sheriff is on Facebook. Um, and I, let's see, I don't know how to put that on the screen right now, but he is on Facebook. You can look him up. I'm assuming that you can do it the same way that, uh, Bobby did. Bobby, appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Okay. And that. Here we go. Uh, Somebody sent me an email, said, Mike, I'm a life group music leader. It's like a homeroom in junior. It's like a homeroom in junior go to Sunday school classes. I have a song, some announcements. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm Jay from, let's see. Let me, um, okay. Yeah, I'll read that. From South Haven Baptist Church, Springfield, Tennessee. And music over life group. It's like junior high school, people to come to half hour early before Sunday school, announcements, songs, and get-togethers, dinner on the grounds, that kind of thing. It's good. Okay. Um, all right. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Um, 
Get your Bible out, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. There's something here that, um, to me, just one day, just boom, it was like, take a look at that, Mike. And I thought, wow. Let's look at it. Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All of those things are going to take place. Mark 13, 8, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. When he says these are the beginning of sorrows, look at sorrows in the Bible. Look at that word, sorrow or sorrows. He says the beginning of sorrows. Look at how that's applied in the scripture. A woman, when she's going to give birth to a child, hath sorrow. Okay? You just kind of ponder that for a while. That's uh, the book of John. Now Luke 21, 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Have you ever thought about what that meant? Have you ever thought about well, okay, it, it, it looks to me like, uh, here, here's what some people say. That's obviously World War III taking place right there. It's like World War III is going to break out, and all these nations are going to be fighting all these other nations, like it was in World War II and World War I, and all these kingdoms are going to be fighting these other kingdoms, and they're all going to be clashing together, and it's going to be calamity all over the earth. Maybe, maybe. Some will even throw in something that I have no reason to believe that it's true. I, and I'm just being honest with you. I've been sent this information time and again. I have no way of knowing whether or not it's true. Um, it's kind of like the quote that Abraham Lincoln made, you see it on the internet. Abraham Lincoln once said, quote, most people on Facebook will believe something that's spoken, especially if it's spoken by someone who is famous. Abraham Lincoln said that. That's a joke, by the way. It's kind of like the picture of Adolf Hitler, and he's holding an iPhone. Looks like he's taking a selfie in the mirror. Somebody says, yeah, we dug this up out of the archives. It's Adolf Hitler taking a picture of himself uh, with an iPhone. And you can't say that this is Photoshop because Photoshop wasn't around when Adolf Hitler was alive. And I'm going, you know what? That's pretty good. Here's what I'm talking about. People say that there, there's this thing floating around the Internet that says that Albert Pike, the grandfather of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, um, wrote Morals and Dogma and wrote some other books as well, got his statue in Washington, D.C. He's buried in the House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. Him and I can't remember who else. They're, it's really weird. Because in the, in the Masonic Lodge Temple in Washington, D.C., Albert Pike's dead rotting corpus and some other dude's dead rotting corpus, carcass, stand as the two pillars, Jakin and Boaz. And I'm just going, okay, that's just, that's weird. But anyway, it's attributed to Fat Albert Pike. And they say Fat Albert Pike warned everybody of a secret Masonic plan to start World War III. Have you heard that one? Masonic plan to start World War III. And everybody peers over this, this statement that Al, the Fat Albert Pike allegedly made. And they're going, yeah, look at that. That's the plan right there. That's what's going to happen. It's sort of like people who read Nostradamus. Nostradamus was, uh, he wrote all these quatrains, 
And everybody says, oh, Nostradamus. Oh, boy, he knew the future. Look at the, he said, he said a guy named Hister was going to take over. And there is no guy named Hister. So people said, oh, Hister means Hitler. Yeah. See, he was almost, he almost got it. He almost nailed it, man. And according to the scriptures, if they say it and it doesn't happen the way they say it, then it's there. You don't have to listen to them. And here's here's my thing, and I and I kind of I rubbed some people the wrong way several years ago when they were hyping about Francis the Talking Pope, about how he was going to be Peter the Roman, he was going to fulfill the prophecy of Saint Malachi, a Roman Catholic priest monk who sat down and wrote out all these obscure things about all the popes, and he said the last pope is going to be called uh, Peter the Roman and uh, listed all this stuff that he's going to do. So Pope JP two died, and then we have um, uh, the mean-looking German evil pope. can't remember his name. And then he mysteriously retired from poping, and they brought in Francis the talking pope. And now everybody's going, he's Peter the Roman. Look at that, he's Peter the Roman. The prophecies are being fulfilled. I, I'll be honest, I have a huge problem with this. I cannot begin to tell you how bad it is to put your stock and your belief systems into the prophecies of something that is outside of your King James Bible. You get to know me. I'm a Bible purist, man. I mean, if it's not in the Bible, what difference does it make what everybody says? People write astrology books every year. They don't care if they don't come out right. They're still going to get paid for it. People still believe in astrology. People go to fortune tellers. doesn't matter that these people make that stuff up. Doesn't matter that they're getting their 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 thoughts from familiar spirits that are from the depths of hell. Doesn't matter. They still keep pouring money into this stuff and they still keep believing it. And people look at prophecies from people like George Washington. George Washington had a prophecy, he had a vision for America. I used to I'm going, wow, look at this, George Washington. And it's like God said, Mike, put it down. Put it down. You want prophecy? I give you all the prophecy you want. Genesis through Revelation, I'll give you page after page after page of prophecy. And I rested in that. I settled in that. But according to people, I don't know I don't know where this came from. Albert Pike predicted not only that there was going to be a World War III, but how it was going to be brought about. And people have made videos on this, and they've written blogs, and it's been in books. And people are asking me, Pastor Mike, have you seen this? Man, we would love to hear what you're going to say about it. Well, I'm saying something about it now, and I'm telling you, put it down. and Back away slowly and turn around, grab your King James Bible, open it up, and start reading, because there is your sure word of prophecy. I, I promise you, I promise you, God is not going to leave you without everything you need to know about what's going to happen in, in the future. I promise you that. You can count on it. It's reliable. You need it. I don't, I don't need Albert Pike to tell me what's going to happen. But anyway, here's what people are saying, that the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, is World War III. Now let's look at this from a from a practical standpoint, okay? Ask yourself this question. Has there ever been times in history where there have been large famines? The answer is yes. Has there ever been times in history when there have been successive strings of earthquakes? Yes, the answer is yes, okay? Um, has there ever been times in history when there have been Pestilences taking over. Yes, the answer is yes. Has there ever been, since Jesus said these words, times when nations have been against other nations and fought wars? The answer is yes. 
so how do we know since there's been earthquakes, since there's been famines, there has already been pestilences, there's been one nation after another for 2,000 years now. Wars never stop. There's always a war on the earth somewhere. Always has been. How are we going to know what this is? How are we going to how are we going to understand this? I mean, you could say that right now we have nation against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there's these company countries, the NATO alliance is against the Eastern Bloc nations, and, and I mean, we just have these things going on all the time. How do we know? Well, let's look. At, let's go back and look at what it says, because this really just hit me. I used to think, yeah, nation against nation, king against kingdom. It's going to be World War III, man. Look at it again. From nation shall be shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. In Matthew twenty four seven, Mark thirteen eight, Luke twenty one ten. They're all singular. And it, and I'm I, you know I looked at all three of them just to make sure that maybe one of them didn't say nations shall be against nations. In all three places, it literally says one nation, singular, against another nation. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, um, we use the word nation in our current 20th and 21st century vernacular to mean a, a civil body politic um, governed by a set of laws and their land territory has a boundary to it. That to us is a nation. And I guess in years gone past, it's not so much now because now all of the nations, really all of the nations of the world are becoming more and more integrated with people of other people of other races or people of other ethnic backgrounds. The Muslims are making sure of that one. So we don't really see nations in the world today or a nation. It's like the United States of America. Ask, you know, ask the question, where do the people of America, where do they descend from? Well, Ireland, Poland, Italy, Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, uh, Africa, mainly Western Africa, um, Laos, Vietnam, Japan, China, and you just keep going and going and going. The pl in Mexico, you just keep going and going and going. The number of ethnic backgrounds that we have in the great American melting pot. When you look in the scriptures, in fact, do this. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 10. The Bible, your, your King James Bible, actually defines the, the, what the idea of the nation is. I could give you a Greek lesson. It would say the same thing. Greek word ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnic. We use the word ethnic to describe someone and their their family or their tribal background. What is your what is your eth ethnic uh, origin? Well, I am uh, American Samoan, or I am um, Peruvian. Uh, native, or I am uh, Mongolian China, or wh whatever. That's their, and, and there are visible differences in all of these different ethnic oranges. You can see it. You can, you can recognize it. If you know what you're looking for, actually, you can, you can recognize people from Japan and be able to set them aside versus people from China or people from Korea. They do all have sort of a different appearance to them. Um, and here, here's what I'm saying. Genesis chapter 10, verse 32 will actually define what the word nation means. These are the families of the sons of Noah. After their, and here's the word here, generations. It has the letters G-E-N-E -E in there. Their generations in their nations and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood how were they divided when you look at genesis 10 you plainly see that here is the hamites here is the japhethites here is the shemites we know that the jews 
the Hebrews descended from Shem. That's where the word anti-Semite comes from. They descended from Shem, and there was a man by the name of Eber. That's where the word Hebrew comes from. And then on down to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then the 12 tribes. And they're all of that. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. Eber's DNA was different, let's say, than um, Togarma over here. They have, a, they have a different DNA structure that's mostly the same. In other words, they're human. They have two lips, two nostrils. They have two ears, two eyes. They have hair on their head. Um, they have skin. They have four chambers in their heart. They had, have these little alvei alveoli things in their lungs. That You know, you get the idea. They're human. But there are some differences in how they look and how they appear. And you can identify them. This is of that family. This is of that family. And so we even do it here in America with, let's say, white Caucasians. We say this of, of children. If we know their grandfather, boy, you got your grandfather in you. I can see it plain as day. Well, you know that that kid is from this family, this nation. And here's, here's what I'm getting at. Let's, let's go through the Bible and let's study, since, since it doesn't say nations against nations, it says nation against nation, one nation against another nation, kingdom against kingdom. Again, that's singular. Now, you could say, All right, Pastor, you think you're making a big thing over nothing. Maybe. I admit, maybe. Why don't we look at the Bible? And, th and that's what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do. You write this down and download the King James Pure Bible Search software. By the, oh, by the way, I got to say this. Everybody's been wanting the Android or iOS version of Pure Bible Search software. I can tell you. Get a Windows tablet. Okay? Get a Windows tablet. Because you can load the PBS software onto a Windows tab because it's Windows. It's Microsoft Windows. And you can load the Windows version of that software on your tablet. You have it right there on your tablet. Uh, Alan from Alan Bama came up here and showed me that he bought it. I mean, it wasn't an expensive tablet at all. It's a little cheap. He got it on sale. And it was Windows 8.1 and had all the, you know, the apps and the swipes and everything like that. And you can put the software right on there. And I'm going, that's pretty cool. I haven't got one yet, but I'm thinking about it. But anyway, just get out, just get the software. Do this. Type in the word kingdom. Type in the word nation. Start at the top, Genesis, and work your way all the way down and read every place in the Bible where it has that in there. And make notes. That's all you gotta do. So here's 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 something I want you to think of. I, I think, I think that there are going to there is going to be a war between this nation and that nation i think there's going to be a war i think that this nation is going to rise up against this nation i mean look at the exact words in your in your bible nation shall rise against nation Again, Mark 13, 8, nation shall rise against nation. Luke 21, 10, nation shall rise against nation. And all three places says the exact, you, in the synoptic gospels, you'll find a lot of things similar. Very seldom do you find them word for word similar. This is one of the exceptions. Nation shall rise against nation. What does that mean? I don't know yet. But now that we know how the, what, what the Bible means when it gives you the word nation, it means a race of people. And we can look at it from a practical standpoint. I've done this for years. We can say, yeah, this ethnos, and yeah, there's, there's going to be race wars. People, there's going to be race wars. There are, there are going to be. But there already are. I mean, even over in Kenya, it, where we're broadcasting right now, Samburu, Kenya, right now. I love you people. I love you. But it tends to be old school Africa 
in some of those outlying areas where our radio station is. And this tribe don't like that tribe. And they fight each other, and sometimes they fight each other with semi-automatic weapons. You think, well, you know, what's their deal? They're all Kenyans. They're all Africans. You know as well as I do. This family don't like that family, and they don't get along. It's that way in every group. The Italians, the Germans, the English, it's that way everywhere. The Hatfields and the McCoys, it's that way everywhere. But you're dealing with one nation against another nation. Let's, let me introduce to you who I think the two nations are going to be. The two nations that I think one of them is going to rise against the other. Here's the first nation. Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. You look at that and say, well, yeah, you know, that's pretty simple. Um, you know, when Jesus came, his own people rejected him. So he goes and, you know, to the Gentiles. Paul took it to the Gentiles. Peter did. Peter was the first one, actually. And take, take the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. Okay, so yeah, I get that. It says, you know, um, the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Here's the problem. On the day of Pentecost, how many different nations, plural, were represented there on the day of Pentecost? I counted 17. But it says here, given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Not all the nations, but a, a particular nation. What nation would that be? I believe that it would be, I'll, I'll read it to you and give it to you as the scriptures do. In Genesis 12, verse 2, God promised, he swore to Abraham, I will make of thee a great, what? nation nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing one nation that's what he would make of Abraham one seed one nation DNA think think bloodline think DNA all right Genesis 46 3 uh, he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. God's people. God's true people are identified as a nation. And according to, according to the rules given to us in Genesis 10, in order to be part of a particular nation, you had to have that bloodline in you, had to have that strain of DNA in you. The Cushites could not be the Pelegs. Two different bloodlines, two different nations. I believe that all of God's people are of the belong to a nation, a bloodline, as it were. Let me let me illustrate it with this. Those of you listening to the radio, look right at the exact center of your FM dial, so you can see the numbers there. See this? See this book right here? This book is where all the members are written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. This book is our DNA in Christ. This is God's book, and our names are in this book. It is the book of life. It is the, the book where all the members are written. Isn't it cool? And even the liberal preachers will say 
Man, them King James only people are strange. They only use the King James Bible. They're just a different kind of people. Amen. I'll own that. I will own that. Those of us who follow one book and one book only, we're different. For better or for worse, we're different than the others. It's a different nation. Why? Just as the book that God wrote in my cells is the DNA forming this body, I believe this Bible is the seed, the incorruptible seed of those who have been born again. Now we are a different nation. Let me read, let me read that to you from the scriptures. Deuteronomy 4, 6, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, plural, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation. By the way, I think God is going to call us Shirley. <laughs> Shirley, this great nation? That was a pretty good one. Shirley, this great nation. <laughs> Oh, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? God had a dream. God had a goal. He had an intention that he would give his people the law. They would honor it. They would keep it. And the world, all the other nations would say, that's a great nation. That is a great people. And by the way, you go back to Genesis 10 again. How are the nations separated from one another by who their daddy is, by who their father is. So now you take that now and think about it. Jesus always talked about I and my father are one. I am from my father. We are in Christ, so we are of his father. And then Jesus turns around to the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, oh, you're a generation of vipers, all right. You generation, you, you uh, generation of vipers, you, you're a child of the devil. That's a different nation than God's people. All right. Two different, even in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, two different seeds, two different bloodlines, two different DNA types are shown in the Bible. Ye are of your father, the devil. You see how it works? We are of our father, the Lord God from on high. They are of their father, the devil. Two nations, two of them. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Does that not have an, another, um, uh, does it not have an, uh, another sort of meaning? Yes, if, if we would maintain God, the Lord our God, as our God in the United States of America, God would bless this nation, but he's not. We have abandoned God as the God of our nation in this country, so now the Muslims are gonna take over. You watch and see if God doesn't let it happen. Um, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people, there's another way of looking at it right there, people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The inheritance is given to the bloodline, to the stock, to the seed, to the DNA recipients. That's who it's given to. Isaiah 55, 5, behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations, plural, that knew not thee, shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. So I want you to think about here God 
is going to call a nation. We know that he calls out to all the Gentiles. Now, all the nations now are going to run into God and all become, just like in America, we all come to this country and we all become one people. Now, that was how it's supposed to be. It's not that way anymore. But this is what God, this, you know, he said, I call a nation. And all the other nations are going to run into this and be part of this seed, this line, this nation. Isaiah 58, 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God, a nation that did righteousness. That's God's nation. Now, New Testament. This, I love this passage. John eleven fifty. Nor consider, see, they were going to, they were going to crucify Jesus, right? The Sanhedrin. And, well, let me read it here. John eleven fifteen. 15. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This Lord of the Sanhedrin, the high priest, was prophesying. Look what he said in verse 51. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Look at that. That one nation is the people that Jesus died for so they could live. The one nation here are those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, just like the Ethiopian eunuch, just like all of those who have accepted, Jew or Gentile, who have ex, who've accepted Christ by faith, without works, and God bestowed his grace upon them, and they become, as Jesus told Nicodemus, born again. But the born again process is not us keeping the same earthly identity. We are born again now, not as sons of men, but as sons of God. One nation under God, indivisible, right? That's the one nation. Now, First Peter chapter two really nails it. All right, First Peter chapter two. But ye, and look here, you even have the word gene in here, G E N E. Ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy what nation you know how you got that first peter 1 23 says you're born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever and let's just be honest niv and new american standard and message churches they are different than king james churches there's a difference in them. Just, I mean, that's just how it is. There is a difference. There's a difference in how they preach. There's a difference in what they preach. There's a lot of differences there. I mean, it says church. Some of them do. But there's a difference. You know why? That's a different nation. That's a different seed. Different DNA. So here we have 1 Peter, chosen generation, a holy nation. How did we get that? How in the world did we get that way? Christ taking our sins away. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's nation number one. 
I think, I think it's possible that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 may not be talking about World War III where all the nations hate each other. and I, It may not be talking about that. by the simplicity of just looking at the language. A nation, singular, against another nation. A nation shall rise up or shall rise against nation. I got to get it right. There's another nation mentioned in the Bible. I got, I got a place to go. Let's see here. I don't have this in my notes. I just just thought of it this just in from god i'm getting a revelation here um where do i look here where do i look go oh yeah oh looky here man uh, go to genesis 25 genesis 25 this is this is it right here this is what i see genesis 25 23 you remember rachel no, it wasn't Rachel, was it? It was uh, uh, Rebecca. Rebecca is going to have a baby. But it's not just one baby. It's two babies. He's going to have twins. But they're not twins. Oh, no, they're not. They're not twins. Genesis twenty-five twenty-three. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now you start just underlying stuff in that verse that sticks out in your head. Two nations are in the womb. Two manner of people separated. You remember what, how? You remember how it turned out? Remember how 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 it turned out? They ended up separating. Actually, it was uh, Jacob that ended up running for his life from Esau, who was going to kill him. Even in Genesis thirty-three, when you find Jacob and Esau coming back together again, meeting each other on the road, Jacob is pretty sure because they spotted Esau with about 400 guys Jacob's going yeah he's he's ticked all right he brought his army with him they finally meet in the road they fall on one another they hug one another they kiss one another it's over the the feud is over there's forgiveness this way God's people ought to deal with stuff we're all not going to get along, are we? No, uh-uh. Jacob said to Esau, come on, come back to daddy's house. Come on, I'm headed there now, got all my stuff. I work for Laban. He's, he's gypped me. I'm out of here. I'm going back to the homeland. Esau, why don't you come with me? Esau said, Jacob, we don't belong together. We are two different people. I'm going to go live my way you go live your way. Have fun with that. Send me a card every now and then. But other than that, we don't belong together. God separated us the moment we were conceived. We were two manner of people inside mom's belly. Now, I'm going to throw something else at you, too. Esau, his other name was what? Edom. Edom and Adam are related etymologically. They, they both have the idea of red earth, clay. Um, think of that which is born of earth is earthy. That which is born of heaven is heavenly. Think of the difference here between Jacob and Esau. By the way, Jacob, or excuse me, Esau, looks like a hairy animal doesn't he? How did Jacob steal Esau's birthright? He cut the skin off an animal, the fur, wrapped it around himself, goes in to dad who can't see and says, 
I've got a cold, but it's Esau. Well, let me feel your skin, son. He feels the fur of an animal. He says, yep, that's Esau, all right. Let me give you the blessing, son. Think, think, Jacob, being those of, who were born of God, and Esau, those who were born of beast. You say, oh, Hoggard, you lost me on that one. There ain't no way you're going to sell that one to me. They're already mixing animal DNA in with human DNA. Do you not know? Do you not see what's going on? They're already doing it. And I just, I look at that and I'm going, you know, there's two men or people, there's two nations, and one of them is the, gets the blessing, and the other one, he's... Uh, He's a hairy dude, isn't he? He's got fur all over him. It's, it's something to think about. This is the other nation. Think of Esau. Two nations, two manner of people. Deuteronomy 28, 33. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt only be oppressed and crushed alway. He mentions a nation here in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy is the blessing and the curse to Israel. It is... God said, if you keep all of my statutes, did you hear that? Did you hear that, Staley? And Mark Biltz and um, Perry Stone and Joseph Farah of World Net Daily and Richard Reeves um, and the Seventh-day Adventist. Did you hear that? Did you hear, did you hear what he said? God said, God said, Deuteronomy 28, all the statutes, not just the ones you picked, not just the ones that you think is possible to keep every now and then. He said all of them. You want the blessings? You have to do all of them. If you miss one, you're under the curse. Don't you understand? If you missed your plane to Jerusalem to hold the Feast of Passover, because that's the only place you're supposed to hold it. If you missed your plane, you broke God's law. You're under the curse now. Go read the Bible. Go read Deuteronomy 28 and ask yourself, do I really have to keep all of the laws or can I just keep part of them and God still be pleased with me? If you break one, you break the whole thing. You broke the law. That, I mean, we even use that terminology now. Well, he was... Doing 56 and a 55. You know what he did? He broke the law. He broke the law. Are you kidding me? One mile an hour over? Are you kidding me? He broke the law. You know what I noticed watching? Um, see, I'm just always thinking about how life is. Christian life, spiritual life. When people don't obey rules and guidelines. I watch this show called Jail. And I see these people being pulled into jail, and they're complaining that the cop isn't smiling at them. They're complaining that the cop's going to make them stand up straight and put their hand on the table and don't look around and don't do this and don't do that. And they're mad because there's somebody telling them every little picky thing to do. And I'm just going, you know what? You broke the law. You're in jail. They're not supposed to be nice to you in jail. Jail is not supposed to be a little vacation spot for you to go unwind. When they bring these drunks in and put them in that holding tank, there's no couch there. There's no bed. There's nothing in there but a floor. And you got to go in there until you sober up. And people don't like it. They don't, I don't like you. Why are you so mean to me? It's because you broke the law. That's why. Some people don't get that. They don't get it. And I listen, I, those who are in law enforcement who do that kind of job, I salute you. I do. I salute you. you got to put up with the very worst people in America every day. You've got you've to face those people one-on-one. -on -one. And I say, be mean about it. Now, there are some stories on there where they kind of talk to some of the people and they find out they got a story and they kind of, I, everybody's got compassion. 
Anyway, according to the law that God said in Deuteronomy 28, if you don't keep all of them, I'm going to pound on you like you've never been pounded before. And he said, a nation which thou knowest not is going to eat your stuff. What nation was he referring to? Deuteronomy 28, 36, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. That's a nation. He's going to put his people under the dominion of a nation. What nation? They haven't known this nation. We haven't had any run-ins with those Klingons yet. We don't know who they are, but we're probably not going to like it. Deuteronomy 28:49. The listen to this one. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. How far? Far. From the end of the earth. Did you, ever, did you ever think about that phrase, the end of the earth? Well, obviously, this was written in a time when people thought the earth was flat. That's why Moses wrote that down. He thought, you know, the end, there was an end there, and if you went past it, you fell over off into the void of space. No, 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 no. And by the way, according to the law of physics, if you start in one place anywhere in the world and start walking straight west, will you run into the end of the world? No. So what does that mean? The end of the world. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth. The end of it. The last part of it. I, I don't know what it means, but I think God does know what it means. I think he said it exactly the way he meant it. And look, look at this. They are as swift as the eagle flieth. And look, they speak in unknown tongues that no one knows how to interpret it. The Lord shall bring a nation, there it is, against thee from far, from, in, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. You ponder that. Because in the world with Google Translate right now, name for me a language that no one else on the earth can understand. Well, other than the angel languages that some of these churches speak, am I right? And he said in verse 50, he said, they're a nation of fierce countenance. Think of the images that are on totem poles and gargoyles and the images that are on uh, Chinese and Oriental canvases and statues and every one of them have this mean appearance to it. Alligators. Alligators never smile. Did you ever think about that? Alligators never smile. Alligators never raise their eyebrows in delight, do they? They look mean. And they're supposed to look mean. Dolphins, however, always smile. And they're always going, hi, I'm so nice and friendly. You don't have to worry about being eaten by dolphins. You do have to worry about any animal that has a fierce countenance. A nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. They don't care. They don't care. That's a different nation than what you and I are. Deuteronomy 38, 32, 28, for they are a nation. Look here, look here. Void of counsel. You know what that means? Neither is there any understanding in them. You know what that means? They don't believe the Bible. They're a nation void. They have, they have voided their mind of the word of God. Psalm 43, 1, judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Now, we were looking at a godly nation. Now, we're looking at an ungodly nation different seed isn't it different dna and let's be honest everybody that's part of this broadcast right now listening or talking we could have just as easily been that other nation couldn't we oh but for the grace of god 
Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. This nation is deceitful. This nation is unjust. They do unjust things, and they have not been justified. Isaiah 1.4, he calls them a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed. Look here. Look here. A seed of evildoers. That means that's in their DNA. Evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they are gone away backwards. Not forward. Uh, not, not like Paul who presses toward the mark. They go backwards. That's where Hebrew roots takes you. Takes you backwards. Come on, everybody. Let's go back to Mount Sinai. Let's get under the let's get under the law. Come on, everybody. Let's go backwards. Isaiah 10, 6. I will send him again. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Different nation, isn't it? Jeremiah 5.15. Listen to where this nation comes from. Lo, I will bring upon a nation upon you from far. O house of Israel, said the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Did you, did you, did you hear that? This nation speaks in an unknown tongue. <sighs> That's heavy. Jeremiah 6, 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. You know what this, you know what this Bible is? It's a stumbling stone. 1 Peter chapter 2. It is the rock of offense. It is the stone of stumbling to them who are disobedient to the word and to them who believe not. People say, oh, I want to hear from God. Well, here's the King James Bible. Oh, you're one of the King James people. Did you hear what they just said? You're of the King James people. You should be going, yes, yes, I am of the King James people. We're a good people, too. We, we, we believe what God said. Um, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, and the neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country. Canada. And a great, uh, a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. Again. Where do you put sides on a circle? Where do you put them? I think God knows. I think the sides of the earth are located at the, at the end of the earth where the corner is. That's what I think. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel. And have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. Go back and read Luke 21. You know what he said? One of the signs of the coming of the Son of Man was the sea and the waves roaring. They ride upon horses. Revelation 9, Joel 2. And one, and set in array as men of war against thee, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the fame thereof, our hands wax feeble, anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in, look at that, travail. That's, that's hooked up to 1 Thessalonians 5, and Isaiah 13, and Isaiah 54, and... Jeremiah 50 and oh yeah it's it's all there people it's all hooked together um well I had a really good thought here just it just flew out of my head um the bones fear the cruel have no mercy voice worth like they ride upon horses I don't remember what it was Jeremiah 50 verse 3 for out of the north there cometh up a nation against her 
You know, he, you know who her is? I'm sure you do. She's your neighbor lady down the road who, when her husband's gone, she's always got a little car that nobody knows who it is out in front of her house every time her husband's gone. It's Babylon, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots. We had a neighbor years ago. Seemed like sweet lady. She was about me and my wife's age. She had two daughters there, and she... Um, she was living with an, an older man. He was probably 20 years older than her. He was a truck driver, and he was as nice as guy as you've ever met. I mean, just good, good guy, good old truck driver. He could be on the road for a while, and he'd come home. Well, we started noticing that there'd be a car parked there in the morning. Who is that guy? He's just a friend, just a friend. Yeah. Anyway, um, for out of the north there cometh up a nation against her which shall make her land desolate. Jeremiah 50, verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Joel chapter 1, verse 6. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. You know who that is? That's the locust, caterpillar, palmer worm army. That, oh, I, I remember what I was going to say now. Todd Bentley's Joel's Army Group, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Kansas City Prophets, um, International House of Pancakes slash Prayer, all of these groups, they refer to themselves as what? The New Breed. They teach that there's going to be an anointing come down from heaven that's going to fall down from heaven on them like angels falling out of the sky. They're going to have a new anointing on them that's going to alter their DNA, making them a new breed or a new species of people that will be the super soldiers for Jesus Christ. And they call themselves after the army of Joel, whose cheek teeth are like a lion, and they eat things like a locust, and they make the sound of chariots, and you go back and read Revelation 9, you'll see everything that's going to happen there. That's who they think they're going to be. They're going to be, listen to this now, they're going to be part of that nation. They're going to be part of that great. You and I were grafted into Christ. Now we are part of his seed, his bloodline. These people also grafted in. I got I got something you're going you're going to like this. Amos 6:14, but behold I will raise up against you a nation. Look at here. Look. Amos 6:14. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it said nation shall rise against nation. Look at here. Look at here. Amos 6.14, but behold, I will raise up against you a nation. O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemoth unto the river of the wilderness. God said he was going to raise a nation up against Israel, which is a nation. Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 6, For lo, I raised up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. Anytime you see the word bitter, think wormwood. Think wormwood. Bitter and hasty nation, who, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. First uh, Samuel 17. In First Samuel 17, we see the Philistines... Um, encamped at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. First time I read that, I went, they're trespassing. Here the Philistines are in the land that God gave to Judah. Philistines don't belong there. That's not their land. They're trespassing. Why? Why isn't anybody doing anything about it? I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you woke up tomorrow morning and there was a tent sitting in your front yard 
and a, and a family camped out in your front yard. You're going, what are you doing? We're homesteading. It's our land now. We got squatters right. See me squatting on it? It's my land now. And you're going, no, it's not your land. You don't get off my land. I'm going to call. I want to do something about it. You can't stay here. Philistines were in Shoko that belonged to Judah. This nation is going to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. I think maybe that dwelling place is the human body. Uh, Philippians 2.15 identifies them this way. You're, you're going to like the language here. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. That is the nation that you and I belong to or should belong to. You should belong to the nation of the sons of God. Blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke. Look there. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. In Philippians 2.15, there's two nations there. One nation is the blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke, which means there ain't no sins to blame on us anymore. They have been removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we are in the midst. You know what the you know what the Bible word for twisted is? Crooked. The crooked serpent. It's like what a serpent does. He twists himself around. In the midst of a crooked and perverse what? Nation. He's not talking about China or Russia or South Africa or the Vatican. He's not talking about any kind of nation like that, or even, God forbid, the Irish. He's not referring to that. He's talking about those whose DNA is twisted and crooked like serpents and perverse. That's, that's what he's talking about. Two nations here. Then he said, kingdom against kingdom. Let me, how much time have I got left? Let me run through this. Numbers 32, Deuteronomy 3, several places, Joshua 13. It all talks about the kingdom of Og and the kingdom, um, the, the, and the kingdom of Sihon. Kingdom of Og. Who was Og? Well, he's an ogre. He was the original ogre. That's who he was. He was a giant. In Joshua 12, make a note of this. In Joshua 12, we have the listing of the two kingdoms that Moses destroyed plus the 31 that Joshua destroyed. Two plus 31. That's a... You have Og, the king of Bashan, his kingdom. You have Sion, the king of Heshbon, his kingdom. Then you have all these other kingdoms, and together there's 33 of them. And they're all giants. From what I can see, they were all giants. And Moses, who represents the Old Testament, Joshua, who represents the New Testament, they killed them all, didn't they? I love that, don't you? I love that. By the way, you, you, you got that in you, don't you? That, that beast nature stuff, 33 bones in your spinal column. You got that in you, don't you? The cross, take it away, man. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, listen to this. Talking about kingdom against kingdom. Um, in Daniel 2, if you want a picture of what it looks like, read Daniel 2. Because Nebuchadnezzar's vision is, a, is a, I think, a picture of kingdom against kingdom. In Daniel 2, 38, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath, given unto, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler of them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the all, all the earth. And the fourth kingdom 
shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And then we see after that a stone cut without hands. It goes and crushes the ten toes, the ten laws, the strength of sin. It destroys that. The image falls and turns into dust and is blown away of the wind. And that stone cut without hands becomes a great mountain. And that mountain represents the kingdom of Christ. Kingdom against kingdom. Matthew 19, 23, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall wholly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They're the same thing. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter what? The kingdom of God. That's the kingdom that you and I belong to. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Um... Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you are listening to that going, uh-oh, that'd be me. Not anymore. Not if you're in Christ. Not if you have that new man in the inside of you. You do, don't you? You have the new man. The new man is renewed every day. He don't sin. He doesn't do and never has done and never will do the things that your flesh did or does. He don't. That's why your flesh cannot. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because it fornicates, it is idolatrous, it is an adulteress, it's effeminate, it's an abuser of themselves of mankind, it's a drunkard, it's covetous, it reviles, it extorts, it steals. Your flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So what is this? You're dealing with two nations. One nation has the seed of the living God, has been born again cannot sin and this other nation you're of your child you're of your father the devil okay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men two nations one rising up against another who's going to raise it up god said he would Galatians 5.21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings of such like of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5.5, 5, for this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's your translation right there, people. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, for, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. By the way, these same bozo the clowns that tell you, oh, you're a Christian, you're supposed to be rich and healthy and have all this stuff. They tell you that you should never suffer as a child of God. That's lies, 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 lies. 2 Peter 1.11, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 12.10, I like this. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Amen. Praise it. So, so what are you saying, Mike? I think nation's going to rise against nation. I think that the nation that you and I belong in has got a fight on our hands against another nation that's going to rise up. I ain't afraid. Well, maybe just a little. 
Oh, I'm sure you got something to say. Brian says, wasn't God talking about what was going on with them at that point in history, or couldn't that argument be? Well, obviously, obviously, Brian, that these these prophecies that we read dealt with things that were pertinent at that time. But remember something. This Bible is a book of present truth. It's true then. It's true now. Um, the prophecies of God, God speaketh once, yea, twice, they always have a partial fulfillment and then a perfect last day's fulfillment. So it's a good question, and I hope I answered it um, in a helpful manner for you. Uh, Katie, hi, Pastor Mike, just had an idea. Do you think it possible that perhaps that once we become a new creature in Christ, that our spiritual or actual DNA is changed and we are different in a way that only God can know. And perhaps just saying, maybe the devil knows this. And this could be why so many abductions and physicals are being done by so-called aliens. We truly are changed once we are born again in Christ. Katie, let me tell you what I think. I think that all of us who have been redeemed all of us, number one, are the church, and the church is always portrayed, especially in Ephesians 5, as a woman. When the woman receives seed from the man, it's like, therefore shall a man cleave to his wife, and they shall too become what? One flesh. What is the perfect ideology of the man and woman coming together in one flesh. It's their baby. Think of, I use this illustration because, and I'm trying to keep it cool for everybody. Um, there's a sermon on sermon. I just did it, I think, a week ago Wednesday called The, the New Man. And I had up on the screen, I had a picture of a seed in the dirt and it showed the phases of that seed. Finally, that seed, you know, blossomed out. So you can think of it that way. We're the dirt, Katie, and dirt stays dirt. That means the, the DNA of our physical body doesn't change. However, there is something being formed in us. Paul said those words. He said, until Christ be formed in you, there literally is a new nation rising out of us. All right. Does that kind of make sense to you? Okay. That's our inner man. That's what, that's what was born of God that doesn't sin. This dirt, pff, it's dirt. Lawrence says, Hello, Pastor Mike. Is not Matthew 13 the announcement and prophecy about the development of that nation that Jesus spoke of, the kingdom of heaven? It will be leavened totally, but the fruit will be the remnant of Israel and the body of Christ, and at the end it will be cleansed from all evil. This kingdom opened by the keys, entrusted by the Lord to Peter, entrusted, entrusted, is until the return of Christ in the same position as the Lord was, rejected by the world. And I'm not follow. I don't follow. I'm maybe I'm not reading it right. I don't follow what you're saying there. Okay, so you have to forgive me for that. Uh, let's see here. AJ, I bought a Windows tablet from Micro Center for 139 bucks, and they Micro Center just came out with a seven-inch Windows tablet for 59 bucks. I went for the eight-inch one, 32 gig of storage, and that's why it costs more. The seven-inch tablet, 16 gig. Uh, anyway, it has a full USB 3.0 port, so you can even put an external hard drive on it. Here's the link, microcenter.com. Uh, the, the, what we're saying is the Windows tablets running Windows 8.1 will run the Pure Bible Search software. AJ, thank you for that. Everybody got to go. I love you. Just be glad that you're part of the good nation. All right? Seriously, just be glad you're part of that. All right? Tell God thank you for what he's done for you. I love you. We'll see you.